Good evening, everybody. Okay, th th thank you very much for <clears throat> those uh, mercifully short but wonderful words of introduction. Uh, they went very well and I think did very well in the process. So, <laughs> program director, Dr. Beryl Botman and uh, the Botman children, and uh, I might as well call them children because we are speaking about the father today. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. In the interest of equality, I have chosen not to mention all the important people here because our constitution says that all of us are equal. And if I mention a few people, I may have to mention everybody who is here and there's not going to be time for that. I am particularly privileged and humbled to give this talk. We commemorate a very special human being. Professor Heyman Russell Botman has made a significant contribution to the struggle for our constitutional democracy. And unknown to me, actually, was my contemporary and my true comrade. I never met him, but you never met all your true comrades anyway. But having read about him, I tend to think that our paths would probably have crossed more than once. I just don't remember, and I'm sad not to remember. He was born in Bloemfontein, five years after me. He was a member of a community, the so-called colored community, that was the victim of the evil of apartheid and suffered very significantly under its oppressive and exploitative impact. But he was not merely a passive sufferer. He did something else. He contributed immensely and courageously to the struggle against the oppressive regime. His activism and contribution to the struggle for democracy began early in his life. And like my contribution, his too began when he was at university pursuing his first degree. In 1976, as a young man, he became the public relations officer of the Student Representative Council at the University of the Western Cape, the UWC. This young student, under the apartheid court thought control regime as a so-called colored person, ought never to have even thought about the sufferings of black African children a thousand miles away in Soweto, let alone read a protest in solidarity with them. Yet, he had the impertinence and the audacity to lead the students at the University of the Western Cape against apartheid in solidarity with the Soweto student mass action and its resultant police brutality. Russell was consequently detained and interrogated, but this neither frightened him nor stopped him. This early, humane, courageous beginning heralded, I think, the professor's sustained commitment to humanity, a determination that at once was guided and guided his religious philosophy and practice. I argue that Russell truly embraced the values of our Constitution. And this may surprise many present here, Professor Botman and I were also brothers in the field of the law. I'm rather sad to say that I was not his brother in the field of the religion. But <laughs> that is neither here nor there. He was awarded two honorary degrees in law, an LLB and a master's degree in legal studies by the University of Aberdeen. It is no wonder that Dr. Beryl Botman, and I salute you, Doctor, once again, before delivering on his behalf an address that had been prepared conscientiously by him, uh, and she delivered this at the graduation ceremony a mere 20 days after he had passed on paid this warm and wonderful tribute to him. He was an activist, she said, 
a peacemaker, a theologian, an academic, and a thought leader of note. And most importantly, she said, and a great husband and father too. I start by talking about Professor Botman's religious philosophy and practice. Professor Botman's religious philosophy, religious practice, and the values embraced by him are reflected in what he wrote, did, and said. He completed his first degree at UWC in 1978, having majored, and these are very interesting choice of major subjects. He majored in psychology, Afrikaans Netherlands, and biblical studies. I was struck by the fact that only one of these majors was about religion, but there's something more revealing about the selection. The soldiers' majors were varied, being concerned with the health of the mind, psychology, with language, and of course with the law. It does suddenly seem that in his early years, Russell did indeed already understand that these forces are all intertwined, dynamic, and integral to life itself. We all know, I hope, that the 80s and the early 90s of the last century represented one of the most important periods of the struggle of our people for democracy. During this vital time, the Reverend Bosman served, according to his job description at least, as a minister of religion in the Weinberg congregation of the then Dutch Reformed Mission Church. This is a complete understatement of his considerable achievements at the time. He was much bigger and achieved much more than the description of him as a minister in the church conveys. The work, responsibilities, and commitment of the professor went beyond the conservatively understood responsibilities of a cleric. All of it was about the struggle against the apartheid evil. They were direct and indirect anti-apartheid efforts. I start with what may be called the indirect contribution, though I understand the problematics of the distinction that is positive. And of course, all you academics will be the first to criticize me for making these kinds of distinctions, because these days we all talk about everything being interrelated. But be that as it may, the professor not only founded a community development project in Parkwood, and managed an educational institute. He was also the manager of a community art center. What is more, this art center was racially transformed as a direct result of his huge and sensitive efforts. And this, most remarkably, before the Constitution's clarion call for transformation began to reverberate across our country. I might mention that Russell was later also the chairperson of the Klein Karua National Arts Festival. All this shows that his religious philosophy entailed a wide definition of religion. Religion was not limited to preaching, preaching in a church or to prayer. Religious practice for him was about participating in the affairs of the community, about racial transformation, about art, about education, and about every other aspect of life and change. Now for the direct contribution during his time. He was integral to the intensifying struggle against apartheid. I remember with awe and pain the contribution made by the church in general and the South African Council of Churches in particular to the struggle against apartheid and for democracy. Professor Botman was a member of the executive of the South African Council of Churches while he was a priest for much of this time. We must remember that he was officially just a minister in a church in Weinberg at the time. But he was at the same time instrumental to the SACC's immense contribution through its amazing and effective stance and actions in support of an unracial democracy. This contribution was crucial. 
For without it, our struggle would have taken much longer. I have no doubt, I really have no doubt, that it was only because of these anti-apartheid activities that he was not only once again arrested and imprisoned in terms of emergency legislation, but was also the victim of banning orders for several years. The professor's religious philosophy embraced an awareness of the need for and his complete commitment to struggle and sacrifice in the war against our evil, evil of oppressors. Russell fought side by side with all of us while he was a pastor in the church. So it fought side by side with us to make our new constitutional order. And even when the new order was in sight and the interim constitution was adopted, giving everyone the right to vote, Russell did not rest. He coordinated, ran, and participated in voter education programs in the process of the implementation of our constitution. He knew the importance of the right to vote and the need to exercise it on an import, informed and objective basis. And he was prepared to work hard and sacrifice to make this happen. We should remember this and contribute towards effective voter education as we painfully and inexorably struggle on the dangerous and potentially deceptive journey to our next election. This is perhaps the best way to remember the Reverend Professor, not by talking, but working with courage and dedication towards a fair process and result in the historic 2019 elections which are to come. Let us make those elections in his name and through our hard work a truly reflection of what our people truly want. Russell's foresight and understanding of the importance and impact of the new constitutional order in our country before the interim constitution was adopted is demonstrated by the content of the doctoral thesis he completed in 1994. You remember that that was the year when the interim constitution was adopted, but his thesis came a little before. Obtaining the degree with distinction, or cum laude, as they pedantically continue to say these days. I wonder whether he would have preferred cum laude or, or distinction, but leave that as it may. The professor certainly foresaw that transformation would become necessary in every sphere of life to make our new order a reality. The thesis was entitled, and wait for it, Dis Discipleship as Transformation Towards the Theology of Transformation. In my view, the professor saw religion as a flexible power, a power that could and should promote the transformation necessitated by the new constitutional order. Our work towards the transformation of our society would certainly be greatly enhanced, enriched, and quickened if all theologians committed themselves to transformation through religion, as Professor Bachman certainly did. Russell's efforts towards the achievement of a real and equal democracy did not cease when our constitution was adopted in 1994. So what did Professor Botman do after the new constitutional order came into effect? During the first five years of our democracy, Russell was a senior lecturer in practical theology at the University of the Western Cape. This points to a philosophy that embraces practice rather than theory in religion. He did many good things there, which I do not have the time to detail. I would emphasize that he was deeply involved in the constitutional objective of racial transformation, conflict resolution, and the public discourse on democracy. In the pursuit of the constitutional vision of equality, Professor Botman organized conferences on anti-racism and on ethnicity and religion. 
but he went far beyond conferencing on these vital topics and beyond promoting a single religion. He established and nurtured relationship between many churches purposefully crossing not only den denominational and religious barriers but racial barriers too. The professor spent the last 14 years of his life at this university. First as professor of missiology, ecumenism and public theology. Then as vice rector teaching for five years and finally, for seven years, as Vice-Chancellor. Before he became the Vice-Chancellor of the University in 2007, he was involved in additional activities of a constitutional variety. He worked hard on the conception and planning of the language policy and chaired the Employment Equity Forum at the University. In my view, his most important work at this time was as convener of the faculty's research and planning team on theological e ethical studies on poverty in South Africa. His contribution as vice chancellor was by all accounts exceptional. I refer only to two important aspects of, of Russell's revitalizing approach, which consolidated the theme of poverty. The first concerns the notion of academic excellence. We've all heard university bosses, and I wonder whether the present vice chancellor does that too. He must, he must tell us. <laughs> but we've all heard university bosses piously proclaim the virtues of so-called academic excellence, as if this were the sole criterion by which a tertiary institution could be evaluated. Russell, I'm very happy to say, thought differently. In a paper read on his behalf by Dr. Bedel Botman at the University of Aberdeen's honorary award mentioned earlier, he said, when I was first appointed director and vice chancellor in 2007, I inherited a first-rate institution, a tower of academic excellence and world-class research. But it was clear, he said, that there were pressing needs in society all around us caused by poverty and sickness and oppression and violence and pollution. We had to ask ourselves, what use would all our knowledge be? And I add in parenthesis, what use would academic excellence be if it did not make a difference to people's suffering? So I challenge Stellenbosch University, he says, to move from success to significance. We had to become more relevant to society, especially its most vulnerable members. I'm glad to say, he said, that my colleagues and students responded positively. Even some of our most skeptical professors agree that to change the world would not be such a bad thing after all. So the status quo is not necessarily all, and we must remember that. The second concept Professor Botman's, uh, was Professor Botman's conviction that poverty was a scourge in society that needed to be addressed urgently. He has written, organized conferences on the subject, and ensured that this institution participated in community development. So it was not only writing, it was practice. He wrote on this topic for presentation at the honorary award just mentioned. He referred to the decision of the Constitutional Court of this country in the case of Hrotboom, in which the court said that the state is, quote, obliged to take positive action to meet the needs of those living in extreme conditions of poverty, homelessness, or intolerable housing. He went on to say, Professor Botman did, no country is exempt from poverty, as we have seen in the wake of the recent world financial crisis. The lives of hundreds of millions of people worldwide are degraded by poverty, and this threatens social cohesion and political stability across the globe. Professor Botman, in possibly this last presentation prepared by him during his lifetime, challenged all the graduates present there at Aberdeen 
to use the law and as our wonderful student speaker said, now I wonder whether he read it, because Professor Botman challenged all the graduates in Ab Aberdeen to use the law as an instrument of hope and to defend socio-economic rights and all other human rights. It is against this background of the professor's religious philosophy and practice that we can now turn to the Constitution and discuss the attainment of its vision in the context of what he would have regarded as important. So we now go to the Constitution. We begin by looking at the preamble of the Constitution in the same way as Professor Botman did in his Aberdeen address. The relevant part of this preamble commits all the people of our country to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. To lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law to improve, and this is vitally important, to improve the quality of life of all our citizens and free the potential of each person. And finally, to build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations. I would emphasize here our commitment to improve the quality of life of all our people. I would next point to some important values that our Constitution enjoins in Section 1. A, human dignity, the achievement of humanity, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. B, non-racialism and non-sexism. C, supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. D, universal adult suffrage, a national common voter's role, regular elections and a multi-party system of democratic government to ensure accountability, responsiveness and openness. I must say something more about the values mentioned in Section 1A. I would suggest that our constitution is not simply a liberal constitution in which freedom or liberty is a self-standing and vital component. It is significant that the values emphasized are those of dignity, equality, and freedom, not freedom alone. This approach is also taken by Section 36 of our Constitution, which permits a limitation of the rights conferred by the Bill of Rights only to the extent that the limitation is justifiable, and I quote, in an open and democratic society based not on freedom, but based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. And note that human dignity and equality precede freedom. The democratic society to which we must have reference is certainly not one, one based on freedom alone, but on dignity, equality, and freedom. In my view, and Professor Botman would certainly agree, the notion of freedom in our constitution is qualified by human dignity and equality. In other words, to permit freedom at the expense of human dignity or equality would be inconsistent with the values of our constitution and inconsistent with the values that the professor stood for. And both human dignity and equality are, unlike freedom, protected by self-tending provisions of our Bill of Rights. Freedom is protected only in the context of the freedom and security of the person. It is now appropriate for us to move to the equality clause that was close to the professor's heart and is crucial to the achievement of a true, true, true societal democracy in our country. Section 9, which is the equality clause, consists of five subsections all of which must be read together. I will not refer to all of them because you can read them. You have a printed copy and the section is there in the footnote. The first section simply asserts that everyone is equal before the law 
and has a right to equal protection and benefit of the law. The reference to equal protection and benefit over and above the notion of simple equality is probably a pointer to the fact that our constitution is about substantive, not mere formal equality. The two sentences of subsection 2 of section 9 are really powerful. The first broadens the ambit of equality, pronouncing that equality includes the full and equal enjoyment of all fundamental rights and freedoms. All of our people are ultimately, ultimately to enjoy fundamental rights and freedoms equally. The second sentence of this powerful provision is perhaps the most important reconstructive provision in the whole Constitution. It was hotly debated and took months to negotiate. It authorizes legislative and other measures. So remember, not only legislative measures, but legislative and other measures designed, and I quote, designed to protect or advance people who have been disadvantaged by past discrimination. But this is not the, not the only objective that these measures must be designed to achieve. The measures must also be designed to promote equality. The Constitution recognizes that not all measures that protect or advance people who have been disadvantaged in the past would necessarily promote equality. Many doubters of the affirmative action provision often ask what they consider to be a question which they perceive will result in an answer destructive of the whole affirmative approach. They ask, but when will affirmative action end? Will it go on forever? The answer is simple. The measures taken must promote equality and will therefore end as soon as, and not before, there is complete equality in our country. Yes. <laughs> Professor Botman believed in and was committed to the achievement of equality through affirmative action. His determination to contribute towards ridding society of the scourge of poverty is also implicated here. This is because much of the poverty in South Africa is plainly a disadvantage visited upon millions of people on account of past discrimination and certainly invites appropriate and programmatic measures by the state to advance poor people and to achieve equality. We must remember the professor by committing ourselves to the achievement of substantive equality. Oh, right. Thank you. By committing ourselves to the achievement of substantive equality, not mere formal equality, but substantive equality through affirmative action. The third and fourth subsections of section nine I'm still at are aimed at ensuring non-discrimination. Two lessons must be learned from these injunctions. The first is gleaned from the fact that the obligation not to discriminate on one or more of certain grounds is imposed not only on the state, but also on everyone. None of the other provisions of the Bill of Rights expressly places obligations on the people in our country. In other words, all the other provisions of the Bill of Rights expressly uh, operates vertically. They all apply vertically in the sense that they place obligations on the state alone unless the circumstances decide, defined in section eight of the constitution require otherwise. The fact that the instruction not to discriminate is the only one that places obligations expressly on the state and all people underlines the importance of this command. Professor Botman will commend all of us, I am sure, to obey this injunction in both its letter and its spirit, and to advocate its obedience by everyone. This is essential to achievement of the vision of our Constitution. The second learning 
arises from the categories of people who are not to be discriminated against, as deduced from the ground mentioned in subsections 3 and 4 of section 9 of the Constitution. These include race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, and language, and birth. I would urge that each of these grounds refers to categories of vulnerable people. I give some examples. The category of race refers not to race groups that are powerful and privileged, but is intended to afford protection to vulnerable people. The same applies to the grounds of sex and gender, which are obviously aimed not at protecting the powerful and dominant men, but vulnerable women. The ground of religion is not there for the protection of majority religions, which essentially protect themselves. It refers inexorably to vulnerable minority religious groups that are susceptible to domination and oppression. I must say, Myanmar does come to mind. The grounds of sexual orientation, age, and disability are likewise aimed at the protection of gay and lesbian people, young children, and older people and human beings who have disability, all weak and all vulnerable members of our society. The categories of people protected convey and signals a decisive leap away from the law of the jungle in which the rich, the strong, and the powerful run roughshod over vulnerable, weak, and poor people. On the contrary, we are required to treat weak, vulnerable, and poor people with care and concern to protect and empower them where this is appropriate and possible. And we commit ourselves to this course, not because we feel sorry for weak and vulnerable people. We do so for our own sakes, because we do not wish to live in a society that wantonly tramples over weak and vulnerable people. The professor would have agreed, I have no doubt. Finally, I speak briefly to the social and economic rights embraced by sections 26 and 27 of our Constitution. The professor talked to these rights and referred to the case of fruitworm as I, referred, as I said earlier. These two sections, besides providing um, protection for people occupying their homes and for emergency medical treatment, oblige the state to take reasonable legislative and other measures to give effect to the rights of access to adequate housing, health care, food, water, and social security. The most important contribution made by the Constitutional Court in the Hrutbom case was to say what was meant by reasonable legislative and other measures. In my view, material aspects of the explanation of this term are the following. First, there must be legislative and other measures. Legislation by itself is not enough. Second, the measures cannot be ad hoc. They must comprise a program that is well coordinated, implementable, and reasonable. Third, a program is reasonable only if it takes into account the people who are most in need and vulnerable and ensures that a reasonable part of the housing budget is dedicated to emergency situations where people are in urgent need, and also ensures that everyone is treated with care and concern. Fourth, every step taken in the process of the development and provision of housing must be reasonable. A number of cases have followed that gave the court an opportunity to develop its jurisdiction and jurisprudence. I will not go into them except to say that in my view, the state has begun to adopt a technical and evasive attitude in relation to the fulfillment of its constitutional obligation. And the court has had to compel it to do so on a number of occasions. The implementation of these rights is essential to the reconstruction of society 
And as the professor pointed out in his Aberdeen lecture, instrumental in the alleviation of poverty. Our government has not fully embraced the importance of the delivery of these services. There was a time when academics made a distinction between three generations of rights in a way that implied that one category of rights was more important than another. So they spoke for of first, second, and third generation rights. First generation rights were all the civil and political rights, like the right to dignity, the right to vote, the right to various freedoms, and so on. Social and economic rights were classed as second generation, while environmental rights were regarded as third generation rights. This di distinction implied, quite wrongly in my view, and I hope quite wrongly in Professor Botman's view too, that social and economic rights are somehow less important than civil and political rights. By the time the Constitution was written, however, academics had come to their senses and they were agreed that there neither was nor could be any hierarchy of rights. All rights, it is now said, are interrelated and indivisible. In my view, however, social and economic rights are more fundamental and important. This is simply because a person who has no food, no water, no home, will never be in a position to exercise his or her civil and political rights. A minimum standard of availability of these essentials is an absolute prerequisite to the effective exercise of civil and political rights. Poverty, which the professor was rightly concerned about, deprives people of their civil and political rights almost completely in a very real and destructive way. The failure of the state to implement social and economic rights constitutes a significant violation of all of the civil and political rights in the Constitution too. This is an egregious affront to and inconsistent with Section 7 of our Constitution that commands the state to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill each and every right in the Bill of Rights. I have to say that one of the most important reasons why the state has been so remiss in its compliance with the provisions of Section 26 and 27 is our government's endemic, deeply cancerous, and treasonable corruption. I conclude by addressing this topic briefly. I start by making the obvious point that the absence of corruption would mean that more money is available for the fulfillment of the rights in the Bill of Rights and the reduction of poverty. I do not wish to bore you by describing the incidents and the extent of the corruption in our government and the ruling political party. It is enough to say, as I have said before, that if I said in public that our president was an honest man, he would be the first to laugh at me. <laughs> he would deride me justifiably for my utter idiocy. <laughs> I do not want to be charged with this offense if the NPA or the president invents it, so particularly to charge me. So to keep my record clean, I do not and cannot say that the president is honest and a person of good repute. We must not forget that the president became president after charges of corruption were, in my opinion, undoubtedly improperly withdrawn at a time when his co-conspirator was serving a term of imprisonment for the sake of for corruption charges. The man in prison was part of the corruption effort while our president was a person who received the money for doing certain things. So how can we expect a clean administration in the circumstances? I wrote this before the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment five days ago, by the way. <laughs> I must not be understood to say that the president is the only corruption culprit. In my opinion, corrupt elements riddle government and the political party in power. This needs to change substantially. The president himself has admitted that the scourge of corruption must be dealt with. 
If the professor were here today, he would be at the forefront of the fight against corruption, whatever the consequences. We must speak out courageously, take part in anti-corruption activity, strengthen civil society, and oppose corruption at every turn. This is what Professor Heyman Russell Botman would have done. I conclude by saying that to remember Professor Botman, all of us must continue to work with zeal, courage, determination, and sacrifice towards the vision of our future society envisaged in our Constitution. We will all work towards equality, support and deepen affirmative action, dedicate ourselves to do all we can to hasten the transformation of our society, empower weak and vulnerable people, and contribute to the elimination of discrimination. And those of us who are lawyers will heed the professor's plea to use the law as an instrument of hope to ensure that the constitutional vision is achieved. Thank you very much. <laughs>